and it is now recording. Um, I'm glad everybody's here this morning. I am Mary Carol Sheffield with the Paulding County Extension Office and Paulding County Master Gardener Extension Volunteers um, have organized this webinar. We had originally planned to have Carol join us in person in March and then when um, gathering restrictions came to bear, we had to cancel. So after a few months of waiting and um, now we have some different criteria for gathering in person makes it a little harder to get a large group together. Um, now we decided we'd do it as a webinar and Carol Height has graciously agreed to do it this way. Um, so I am gonna be behind the scenes helping with the technology here. And Carol will be giving the presentation. Carol is a Carroll County um, Master Gardener and also um, a very active member of the West Georgia chapter of the Georgia Native Plant Society. So I am gonna turn it over to you, Carol, and let you start talking and I will be here to help move slides as we go. Okay, uh, well, welcome everybody. I'm, I'm glad to be here on the internet with you since I couldn't be there in person. Uh, someone asked me about my garden and so I decided several years ago to put together just some pictures that I snapped throughout the year. This is, this is a collection of pictures of some of the plants in my yard and they're grouped by months so that you can kind of get an idea of what's blooming when. It looks like I have an awful lot of bloom, an awful lot of flowers, and I do, but nothing's, nothing in mass any time during the year. Like everything doesn't bloom at the same time. So you just kind of have to, um, uh, understand that this is spread out over a whole year. And a second thing, I've identified these plants, but sometimes um, we have squirrels that like to pull my tags up out of the ground and I'm, I'm do, I've done the best I can to identify them correctly. But if you see something I've done wrong, I've identified incorrectly, you let me know. Okay, Mary Carol, I'm ready to go. Hey, I'm hitting the button and I'm it's not happening again. <laughs> Okay, in January, I don't generally have a native plant blooming, but I do have some things that are green year round. We have several evergreen ferns in Georgia. One on the left is the Christmas fern, on the right is the ebony spleenwort, and I've got a lot of mosses that stay green throughout the year. Um, many of these prefer a lot of moisture, but I have a very dry yard and I don't tend to water very much, but they do, they do well. They don't do as well as they would if they were in a really damp place, okay? The first blooms I spot are the hepaticas, uh, also called liverwort, and these will start blooming in late, late January and early February. Uh, the blooms persist for a week or two, and then the leaves will still be visible throughout the fall, although they'll turn kind of a purplish color in the fall. Um, liverwort, because they believe that in, when they used herbal medicines, they believe that this could be used to treat problems with the liver, okay? In February, we begin the season of, of the early spring wildflowers and spring ephemerals. Spring ephemerals are those plants that come up, bloom, set their seeds, and die back to the ground about the time the trees are putting out leaves. And the reason they do that is they can take advantage of the extra sun when the leaves are not on the trees. The first one here is a shooting star. Uh, it's one of my favorites and it got its name because it looks like a burst of fireworks that have exploded up in the sky easy to collect the seeds and easy to grow from, pretty easy to grow from seeds. Um, these will bloom for uh, up to six weeks sporadically. And as you can see, the blooms open sequentially. So you have a long bloom time, even though those first blooms may be setting seeds when the last of them have started um, uh, opening up, okay? Go back, uh, the trout lilies. Uh, trout lilies got their name because the leaves look like the speckled belly of a trout, uh, a speckled trout. They bloom about two to three weeks, over a period of two to three weeks from February through April. And there again, they bloom sequentially. So not every bloom on the plant is open at the same time. So you get a longer period of time. They multiply pretty rapidly and they make a nice ground cover. If you want to see trout lilies, there's a place in middle towards South Georgia called the Wolf Creek uh, trout lily preserve and the time the day that I went over there they estimated there were about five million of these blooming at the time okay 
quaking ladies are what we call bluets. Uh, you probably have seen these growing on the sides of your, your uh, driveway, maybe in some gravel, in your grass. They only get about two or three inches high and they're, they're really pretty blue, always four petals with a yellow eye spot in the center. And they will form masses. They're a very dainty little plant, but they're pretty resilient. If you step on them, they'll pop right back, okay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> there. <laughs> I wasn't sure you were still hearing me. Uh, this is an Alabama leatherwood. It's a beautiful little shrub. Uh, not not very often used in the gardens. It is uh, deciduous, and a lot of people like their shrubs to be evergreen. I have this out along the edge of the woods. It has these pretty little yellow flowers in February. Um, very hard to find these. I was given this by the curator of the uh, botanical gardens over in Birmingham and and uh, one of my favorite little shrubs I enjoyed every year because it's blooming when almost nothing else is blooming. Okay. And in March we have another shrub from Alabama called the Alabama snow wreath shrub. This is a suckering shrub so you get lots of little ones from it if you want to share. has all those fuzzy white blooms that just uh, bloom all along those long branches. It'll get four to six feet tall, uh, and but it's very easy to prune and responds well to pruning, okay? The toothwort, and in the background you'll see a little blood root. The toothwort uh, is a great pollinator plant for the early pollinators. Um, has, it's called cut leaf toothwort because of the leaves have all those deep cuts in them, and um, blooms for a couple of weeks and sets seeds, but it's very slow to multiply from seeds in my yard. It may not be that way in other yards, but it is in mine. Okay. This is bloodroot. It is probably the prettiest wildflower. I'm, I'm saying that because I'm looking at it right now. Everybody asked me what's my favorite flower and I say what's blooming right now. So uh, this is beautiful. It's kind of a creamy white with those beautiful yellow uh, 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 anthers with the pollen on them and these are usually pollinated by ants and uh, small small insects that are out early and the ants collect the seeds and take them to their nest, feed the, and the, the babies eat the, the fatty tissue on the outside of the seed and then the mother ant takes it out of the nest and throws it out on the ground and scatters your seeds for them. So I started out with two or three clumps and now I got it in about 20 different places because thanks to the ants, they've scattered them for me, okay? This is a combination that I love. It's Tiarella in the background and blue-eyed grass in the foreground. The Tiarella is also called foam flower because the, the blooms do look kind of foamy. They look, a, the, the leaves look a lot like coral bells, but they'll bloom for a long period of time. They will reseed, but then they're slow to, to grow from seed. The blue-eyed grass gets about eight inches high and about 12, 15 inches across. Has those pretty little blue blooms with the yellow eye in the center. Uh, will rebloom when it when it uh, when the rains pick up uh, later, but mostly I I grow them because they're nice and green and they they make a good border for uh, edging for the garden. Okay. The silver bell tree is spectacular when it's in bloom. These little bells dangle down from from stems that just kind of make them when the wind blows they just kind of bounce in the in the wind and then they have the most unusual. Uh, seed pod that looks like a miniature um, passion fruit uh, but they're these trees are um, you can't find them in the nursery most of the time you have to um, find somebody who has one who might have some growing from seeds or maybe order online but I found this one at an Ace Hardware down in Florida when I went to the Brave Spring training so they can be found but you've got to talk to your uh, um, plant suppliers around your area to get them to get these things in or you're going to always have to buy them from a distance. Okay. Mary bells are, are just a beautiful little plant. You can see the dangly yellow blooms. It's called uh, Uvulary perfoliata and that's because the stem of the flower seems to perforate the leaves. They have a pretty long bloom time and make a nice little squatty green seed pod so it adds a little interest to the garden and they are a spring ephemeral, meaning they'll come up, they'll bloom, and then they'll disappear and you won't see them again until next year. Okay. Bird's foot violet, if you look closely at the leaves, you'll see those, those leaves that dangle out look kind of like the 
prints of a bird when it steps into the dirt or mud. Uh, and that's where it gets its common name. Surprisingly, this plant does not like rich soil. It prefers our Georgia clay. I, I had to actually dig out a section of my garden and haul in some red dirt to put in there to get these things to thrive. Uh, uh, until I did that, they were mostly coming up for one year and then never coming back again. So now I've got a pretty good little crop of them because they're all planted in red dirt. <laughs> okay. Two kinds of Amsonias. This is the Hubrichtii. Uh, blooms in the early spring, makes these funky little long seed pods with a, a brown seed that looks kind of like it's covered with brown velvet. And uh, they're good pollinator plants. They uh, And the pollinator plants in the spring uh, actually tend to feed critters that aren't around when you have your summer pollinator plants. So it's important that you have a lot of early spring and mid spring blooming plants for those early insects that come out. Okay. Go back one. Uh, yeah, back, yeah, there. I know when you see the word um, uh, wisteria, go ahead one now. <laughs> there. I know when you hear the word wisteria, you go, you cringe because you're thinking of the Japanese or Chinese wisteria. This is our native wisteria called Amethyst Falls. I've had this one, as you can see from the stems twining around the uh, post there, I've had this one in the ground for about 10 years. And last year is the first time I've had suckers that I've had to get out of the ground. Uh, they pop up and I just pull them up and chop them up, chop the root off and, and I've kept it under control with very little effort. It's about twice that size. Now I didn't get as many blooms this year as I had been in the past and I guess I need to do some judicious pruning to get it to bloom better. Okay. And in April, uh, the columbines, you see red and yellow. The red outer attracts the hummingbirds and the tubular shape attracts the hummingbirds. <clears throat> I have this planted in a big garden next to a very large coral honeysuckle, and they're blooming at the same time, along with the red buckeye. The red buckeye is the first plant, that the, the first flower that the hummingbirds look for on their northern migration. They'll hang around for the columbines and for the red honeysuckle. I still have hummingbirds out there uh, uh, visiting my honeysuckle. The columbines have stopped blooming now, but these reseed profusely, so if you know somebody who has some, they'll probably be glad to share some with you, okay? The spring beauty is a pretty little um, plant that gets only a few inches high. Uh, the American Indians dug it up and ate the roots, but I, it's so pretty, I don't wanna sacrifice it to taste a root, but uh, they don't last very long. They're a spring ephemeral. They'll come up and, and bloom for a couple of weeks and then they'll die down and I won't know they're there until next year, okay? The Virginia bluebells are kind of hard to get established, but once they're established, you'll have a nice crop of those. Uh, they start out with that hot pink uh, uh, bloom, and as it as it matures, it turns into this beautiful purplish blue, kind of a sky blue. Very good for pollinators. Anything with that tubular shape is good, usually for the long-tongued bees and uh, butterflies. Okay. I first saw Facelia when I went on a hike at the um, Pocket, which is a great wildflower hike up in northeast, Georgia, northwest Georgia. It's also called scorpion weed. It has a pretty little fern-like leaves and, and um, blooms profusely. It's a biennial, so uh, I planted my first one and collected some seeds and allowed some seeds to sprout, kept some seeds for the next year so that when those that sprouted that first year go through their first year, then I can plant the seeds and I'll continuously have blooms year after year. Although I have to say some of mine um, came back and bloomed for a second year, even though they're supposed to be biennial. So you just never know. You just have to play around with these plants and see what they'll do for you. Okay. Cross vines climbing up my oak trees and I just love it. Uh, the hummingbirds love it too. This happens to be the yellow with the red throat. You, there's also a variety that has a red with a yellow throat and there's some that is just the solid brick red. So very pretty plant, but it won't bloom till it gets way up in the trees where it can get some sunshine. Uh, this is a, not an aggressive vine at all. You may occasionally find a sprout here and there from a seed, but for the most part, it's well behaved. Um, so it's a great vine to have. I, I'd recommend this to anybody. Okay. 
Solomon's plume um, gets its name because of the plume of flowers. It's like a feather at the end of each stalk. It, when, it, right, when it forms its seeds, the seeds will be kind of a um, fleshy colored uh, with little maroon spots all over it. They're very, very attractive and I never can get to them before the birds get to them. So I'm going to have to start putting a, a, a bag over the blooms if I want to catch some of those seeds. But I just let them fall. I started out with one plant there and probably got two dozen there now uh, because the seeds have sprouted. Okay. We have more trilliums in Georgia than any other place in the United States. More varieties. This is five of them that I have in my yard. I've got a few others, but I didn't have room on the slide for the rest. Up on the left-hand side is Trillium cuneatum or Sweet Betsy Trillium. It... Um, it has been up and visible since uh, maybe February and it's still up and visible, although it's not blooming right now. Uh, the next one is the Trillium rugelii, which is the Southern Nodding Trillium. Uh, you can spot it by those uh, maroon stamen in the center. The Trillium luteum is a yellow version of the, uh, of the uh, Trillium. Called yellow white robin, and at the bottom left is the Trillium catesbii, which is the most common trillium in our area. Uh, and as it ages, that bloom will become pink, and you'll know that it's getting ready to set some seeds. And the last one is a, something I got from a fellow down in LaGrange. It's called a, tr a Trillium staminium, which is a twisted or a propeller trillium. If you look at that right hand side, you'll see that that uh, one one petal that is sort of twisted around. So they call it a twisted trillium. Okay, and in May, there's some large bluets. I showed you the little bitty ones that grow on the edge of your driveways and in your grass. This one gets much larger. It's called, this one's called Venus's Pride, where the other one is called Quaking Ladies. Gets about 10 inches high, uh, has these blooms for a long period of time. If you'll notice with your wildflowers and any flower, basically, you'll see these, the blooms and, and all around those blooms, you'll see the little round, green buds of the upcoming plants and you'll see some that have already sprouted but haven't opened up so since there's so many of them there as the new as the old blooms die off those that are, are still there will just keep blooming so this will probably be blooming for six weeks over a period of time and it's a pretty little plant it's a it's something just to tuck into a little spot where you just need something to fill in a bed okay the lady fern is recognizable. If you'll see that center frond, look down towards the bottom and you'll see that the last two leaflets sort of point backwards. I had a friend who couldn't remember the lady fern and she finally said, oh, I know, I'll just think of that as her, her uh, skirt hanging down to cover up her petticoats. Uh, that she calls it a lady fern. And it has, sometimes they have a brownish stem, sometimes they have a reddish stem. Easy to confuse for a lot of people tell me they can't tell them from cinnamon ferns, but if you look very closely at the tiny little leaflets, they have teeth, and the cinnamon fern has a smooth edge. Okay. Uh, Mouse-eared Coreopsis got its name because its leaves are rounded and look like little mouse ears. It's a uh, uh, plant that sends out um, uh, uh, roots that will, or stems that will root to the ground, so it spreads pretty easily um, and makes a great little ground cover will rebloom if you've got time to stand out there and prune off all those old blooms. I just don't usually get around to doing that. Okay. Maidenhair fern is one of those that I call it a stunning plant because everybody who comes in the yard and sees that in this pot says, what is that? And I need one of those. That is a maidenhair fern, uh, very different from a lot of ferns. It has a long stem and then at the top it has what I call five finger fronds. There's like five little different uh, fronds that just kind of come out and they flop over so that they kind of just dangle out a 45 degree angle uh, or 90 degree angle. So nice filler for, and it usually likes a damp place. This is in an old clay pot and I don't, I, I hardly ever water it. So it, it does okay with less water than you would think for a fern. Okay. Probably the most stunning plant in the garden when uh, at this it was the Indian pink. It got its name because it was kind of pinkish. It's a hummingbird magnet because of the tubular shape and the orange, um, the red and the yellow. It will make seed pods that are on kind of like a catapult system. And as they ripen, the catapult will just fling the seeds and they'll go anywhere. And I've had a few to come up from seeds and I've tried growing them from seeds, but 
uh, they're very difficult. I talked to the uh, guy in charge of the botanical gardens at the UGA and I told him I'd grown one from seed and he said, well, I wish you'd write that down and tell me how to do it because I've never been able to get up come up from seeds, but I collect them every year. I buy those little bags at um, Hobby Lobby in the bridal section that are the little organza bags with a drawstring. And if I want to collect the seeds, I just pop one of those bags over the seed head over the over the flower head when some seeds are there and pull the drawstring and then when they explode they go in the bag and I collect them that way so you can do most any of your native wildflower seeds that way if you want or any kind of flower seeds that way if you want to collect seeds okay sun drops you can see all the little tiny uh critters I don't know if those are bees or flies or wasp they're not wasp or whatever they are but anyway this is a great early spring uh, flower that has those just beautiful um, yellow blooms and uh, nice green sort of um, shiny green leaves. They, the leaves stay very low in a rosette when they first start coming up but then they'll get maybe eight or ten inches tall and these blooms will persist for a long time because there again you see that there are lots of buds waiting and as these that fade the others will bloom out and it is one of those plants that when you share it with somebody you need to tell them that it uh, it's a great pass along plant because it does spread uh, pretty rapidly. But if you want a nice ground cover that has that pretty bloom in the spring, then let it spread. Okay. I love the combination here of the pink purple cone flowers and the hot pink rose campion. Uh, those purple cone flowers have been blooming since um, June, I think, and they're still blooming if I keep them deadheaded. But I will leave the last stalks on because. The, uh, and some of them I've allowed to go to seed already because the goldfinches will just attack those things and eat the seeds from those um, purple cone flowers. So if you have somebody there at your home who loves bird watching, plant some purple cone flowers and just wait for the finches to come because right now the males have that beautiful yellow plumage and when you see that yellow goldfinch on that uh, stalk snatching up those seeds, it's a, it's a pretty sight to see. Okay, and in June, these are thimble weeds and they get their name. You'll notice at the very top of the stalks, those little green things, they've got little dimples in them, look just like a thimble uh, that somebody wears when they're sewing. Has a kind of an inconspicuous little bloom, but because there are so many stalks, you get a lot of those little blooms and it makes quite a little show. Those grow in full sun and they reseed. When that little thimble pops open, it looks like little balls of cotton with a brown spot on them and that brown spot's the seed. So if you don't want them coming up, any, just anywhere they float to, you need to uh, deadhead those and not let them go to seed. Okay. Stokes asters is an underused plant, in my opinion. It's been around for a long, long time. It's a great pollinator plant. I don't think I ever go out in the garden when I don't see bumblebees on the Stokes asters. But a lot of people don't know this. Once those blooms fade and you start to see the, them, the blooms turn brown, clip them off, that whole stalk of bloom off, and you'll get another flush of blooms. Uh, and that'll usually happen when you get it clipped right after the first flush of blooms, it'll, it'll bloom again or sometime around August. Clip it again and you probably get more blooms again before frost. So you can get three successions of blooms from the Stokes Aster if you're deadhead. Leave those last blooms on there when it uh, towards the fall and you can collect seeds and you can just throw those seeds out on the ground and grow them wherever you want them. Turks cap lilies grow between five and seven feet tall. They got their name because of the way the petals fold back. It looks like the cap, like the little hat worn by some of the Turks back in the olden days. I don't know if they still wear them. Uh, I have yet to see these set seeds, but they do make beautiful flowers. Some people confuse them with uh, um, tiger lilies, but lower on the stem, you'll see the leaves make a complete circle around the stem where tiger lily seeds don't do that and the tiger lily, I mean tiger lily leaves don't do that and the tiger lily blossoms do not fold back like that, okay? The trumpet creeper vine can be a little invasive, but there again, uh, all you gotta do is pull it up and chop the root off and, and get rid of that little place. And because it is tubular shaped and orangish red, it does attract hummingbirds and, uh, and long-tongued long bees and butterflies. So it's a great plant to have if you have a pollinator garden. The coral honeysuckle blooms. I, I prune mine in January, do a heavy pruning in January and fertilize. No, I do a heavy pruning when it stops blooming in the fall. 
and then I do a fertilizer, a complete fertilizer in January, and I get blooms for probably five months, maybe six months. Mine has, still has some blooms, and it's beginning to have some pretty little red berries, which the birds will eat, and then they'll scatter it for me. Uh, it has to be on a trellis, though, because it just sprawls everywhere if you don't put a trellis there. July, we're getting into the hot months and the dry months. This was a new plant to me last year, and it has been a super big hit in my garden. Uh, because of its shape, it takes something like a bumblebee or a, a larger insect to get down in and get the pollen, but it is covered with insects during the, during the July and August. Um, it's called, uh, it's a scutellaria. I have some scutellaria growing out in the front yard that's for the shade, and it does not get nearly this big. This thing gets about three to four feet tall. I deadhead it and it'll, re it'll bloom off and on till fall, but I do let the blooms, some of the blooms go to seed because I collect the seeds and I've grown about 300 of these from seed this year. So we're having a plant sale on September the 19th at the Ag Center in Carroll County and we'll have some of these for sale. Okay. The cardinal flower is a, a hummingbird. I've seen hummingbirds on mine three times this week. And it's an amazing flower because it has the flower that's in the foreground. You can't see it very well because it's fuzzy, but there's a little frill hanging down and that's, that's where the pollen is. And when the hummingbird comes in and, and goes down into that plant to get nectar, that pollen brushes off on its head. When the pollen brushes off, then that flower becomes the receptacle for the, or the female part for the pollen to be re, uh, deposited there. So when the hummingbird comes back again a couple of days later, it's got still got the pollen on its head, sticks its head in there again, and now it puts the pollen back into the flower and causes it to make seed. The seeds are like little brown dusts. They're so tiny you can't separate them to plant them, so I just sort of broadcast them over a, a tray and and I may have 10,000 to come up and only save two or three hundred out of the 10,000, but because they are so tiny, you cannot individually plant them, but you can plant them in a tray in January. Let them stay outside in the cold and you'll get some sprouts and then you can pluck them out of there. It's good for a rain garden. I put a rain garden in this year and uh, put cardinal flowers in there. It's their first year and they're, they're already blooming this year, okay? Another stunner in the garden, this is the native spider, Lilia hymenicalis. Uh, if you measure from the tip of one strap to the tip of the other strap, it's about six inches wide. The little, cent the little center blossom, the bloom is not, uh, is maybe an inch and a half, two inches across. Has very long sta uh, uh, stamen with the pollen at the end on the anthers. I'm not even sure what pollinates this, but I do get seeds from it and I, they're difficult to, to sprout, but I Put them, I plant them in my vegetable garden when I clean my vegetables off in the fall and just left them and I dug them up about mm, about a month and a half ago and they had sprouted and I dug them and I've put them in pots and now they've made their first set of true leaves. So they're coming right along and I'll have those ready to sell probably not this year, but maybe next year. Okay. This is a yellow fringed orchid and why they named it yellow fringed, I don't know because it's obviously orange, but anyway, it is one of our many native orchids. We have quite a number of native orchids. Not, not, not any of the others are quite as impressive as this one, it, not any that I've seen anyway. But this I have put a little plastic Rubbermaid tote in the ground, put some peat moss mix in it and uh, drilled a couple of holes up near the top so it won't stand in water. And then it just, that peat moss keeps it moist and it grows just like it was, as if it were in a bog garden and it's out in full sun, okay? The Silene family is, is one that I have been collecting different, one, different ones in that family for a couple of years now. My first one was in the upper left-hand corner of the fire pink. That blooms early on, uh, uh, and this is sort of out of sequence as far as time, but I want to put all these on one slide. Uh, you can identify the fire pink because of the notches in the end of each petal. It has the uh, five petals, just like the one in the lower left-hand corner, which is royal catch fly and the way to tell the difference number one is the bloom time but also you'll notice the rounded edges of the petals of the uh, royal catch fly as opposed to the notch on the right hand side are two of the white silenes the top is starry campium i got this on a rescue way over in alabama 
and didn't even know what I had. And it came up in the yard and I said, what in the world is that? So I had to call my guru who knows all the native plants and he told me what it was. And I've actually collected seeds from this and I've grown some from seeds, but I'm not ready to share those yet because they're still kind of small. The one in the bottom is the Blue Ridge Campion. It's, it's becoming quite rare and uh, mine is ready to bloom right now. Uh, it will set seeds, but I don't disturb these seeds. I let them fall on the ground, let mother nature take care of them since it is uh, becoming threatened and I might not have as much success growing those from seeds. So I just leave those alone and someday I'll have enough to share. A sneeze weed, uh, most sneeze weed that I've ever seen is yellow, but I just love this maroon color and with all the yellow pollen um, anthers inside there. Uh, it's a nice addition to the garden. Mine didn't do as well this year's, this is last year's picture because of the drought. I had a half inch rain for the entire month of July. So what normally would have been blooming in July in my yard is, is a little late getting started. Um, so this is a good little plant, tall, about maybe two feet tall. So it's a nice uh, middle of the border plant, uh, middle of the bed plant if you, have, if you grow from large at the back to the shorter at the front. This one needs to kind of go in the center, okay? Black cohosh. I saw this first on a rescue in Cobb County. They had a hillside of it blooming with all these stalks of this beautiful white bloom up there. Uh, very, very hard to grow from seeds. Um, I have had maybe one out of, I don't know how many tries I've done, I've had one to sprout. So the best way to get more of these is to wait until they get a little bigger and then take root cuttings or divide them when they get bigger. This is the wild quinine. I found this on the side of the road somewhere and took one home with me and I've grown it from seeds. And it's, um, it's a pretty little plant, it's blooming right now. It does have a tendency to fall over because of the heavy load of flowers it has on it. So sometimes I have to stake it, sometimes I don't. It depends on how much sun it's getting a lot of times, but it's a pretty little plant and it is uh, the plant that they got the quinine for um, when they were treating malaria. So it's a good plant to have. The Texas star hibiscus is a hibiscus coccineus. There's also a white version of this called the Lone Star, but it's still coccineus, although that, that indicates red. But um, so it's a short-lived flower though. It's just like bloom today, gone tomorrow. But then you got buds waiting to, for another one to bloom tomorrow and then they just bloom in succession so and these are easy to collect seeds from you can grow them very easily from seeds so if you know somebody who has one ask them to save you some seeds okay moving into august uh this is the blue uh lobelia as opposed to the cardinal flower has the same shaped bloom with the um uh, lip on the bottom and the kind of overhang on the top it even though it's the blue, it still attracts uh, a lot of the insects, at, but it, I've never seen hummingbirds on these, so it does not attract hummingbirds to, my, to the best of my knowledge. The blazing star, unfortunately, I didn't take a picture until it had already started to fade, but that's okay because you'll notice the top flowers have already turned brown. They're setting their seeds. The bottom flowers are still uh, pretty healthy looking. And then it's got a stalk beside it that hasn't even started opening up yet. So this is a hot weather plant, does not mind it being dry and is a great pollinator plant because of the number of flowers. I always say, when you go to the grocery store, you want them to have all the groceries right there in one store. You don't want to have to go to six different stores to get your groceries. Well, insects don't want to have to go to six different plants to get nectar and pollen if they can go to one and get it all over, get, get it all right there. They save energy by not having to go from flower to flower. So plants that have multiple blooms on the stalk or composite plants like zinnias, which are not native, but the zinnias and some of the asters, those have more pollen and nectar in one spot than, than a lot of plants. So that's why they're very popular with the pollinators. Okay. This is a Coreopsis, and I do not remember what kind. Thank you, Mr. Squirrel, um, has pulled up my tags, but I can, I'm sure I can uh, find out what kind it is, but it's just pretty. I like the, the contrast in colors. It's not very tall. It's maybe eight inches high with the blooms and fills in spaces in between plants that are dying down at this time of the year. Some of this I have planted in partial sun, 
some I have in full sun and they do equally well in both places. Moving into September, which we're about to do. The pink turtle heads, if you'll look at one of those flowers on the left, that bottom lip sticking out and that overhead, it got its name because somebody who looked at that said, hmm, that looks like a turtle's head. So I'm gonna name it a turtle head. You can get pink turtle heads, white turtle heads. These are, are uh, they don't like insects much, I guess, because they make it very difficult to get in there to get the nectar and the pollen. And bumblebees are about the only thing I've ever seen that are big enough bullies to get down in there and really get down into that flower. So you may find bumblebees on your, on your uh, blooms. And I do have leaf damage. That's okay. If you've read Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, he will tell you a leaf with no holes, uh, with no insect damage is a useless plant as far as our wildlife is concerned. And, and when we're talking about pollinators, you're talking about uh, maybe caterpillars being there eating those leaves. Those caterpillars then become food for the birds. And birds, even if they eat seeds when they're adults, 90% of them feed their babies insects because they're soft and they swallow easier. So if you don't have plants that you allow, in, allow caterpillars to mature by eating the leaves, then you're gonna have fewer birds than you would have if you'd leave the caterpillars alone, okay? This is a royal fern and people look at that and say, that doesn't look like any fern I've ever seen, but it is a fern. Um, has much bolder leaves, I guess, that leaflets than most of the ferns do, but it's a pretty fern and I don't have any idea where it got its name unless it just looks regal to somebody, <laughs> okay? This is, I've got that label George Aster. This is not George Aster, this is aromatic aster. Uh, George Aster has a white center instead of the yellow center. And I thought I changed that, but I've got two versions of this PowerPoint and I guess I didn't change it on this one. This asters are the, asters and goldenrod are the two most important plants you can have in your garden or in your landscape for the fall for the pollinators. This is their last gasp. Uh, before they go into hibernation or before they die, they have to have some asters and goldenrod because there's very little else blooming that still has plenty of pollen and nectar. This happens to be a monarch on this um, aster on her, his, that's a, that's a, I think that's a male, on his journey back home to Mexico. So uh, in order for the, for the monarchs to get back from their uh, northern migration and go south, they have to have these fall plants as a way station. Also a great time to have the late summer, early fall, you must have milkweed because they have to lay their eggs because this, this butterfly will never make it to Mexico. It will lay egg, uh, it's made, the female will lay eggs here in Georgia and those may make it there, they may make it only to Texas, but it takes about five generations of monarchs to get up there and, get, and then again to go back. So you have to have those milkweeds all along a fly, flyway for the monarchs uh, so they can make it from Mexico to Canada and then back to Mexico again, okay? That's a New England aster. Uh, I don't know much about it. This is new to my garden. I do know they've got to have a lot of sun to bloom well. Uh, this one is not growing very tall. The aromatic aster you saw a while ago gets about three feet tall, three or four feet tall. This one stays pretty low, and that may just be the conditions that it's growing in in my yard. I'm not really sure how tall it can become. I've only had it for a year. In October, we're kind of winding down the flowering season in October. This is a jewelweed, grows in moist soil right along creek banks. I have some in my rain garden. And jewelweed, if you'll take, it's, it's, it's uh, in the same family as impatience, it is an impatience. So it has that fleshy stem. If you get exposed to poison ivy, you can take that fleshy stem and crush it in your hands and get that juice out of it and rub it on there. And it will help to keep the poison ivy from turning into blisters. I use this and I boil the, the uh, stems and keep a, a little jar of this in the refrigerator for the winter, for winter because you can still get poison ivy in the winter if you mess with the roots and the stems that are growing on your trees. So this is a good, good use for that when you're out in the woods and you don't have any way of getting that a poison ivy oil off your skin. Okay. These are the calico asters and they're beautiful. They are fall blooming just like many of the other asters. There's a couple asters that bloom in the early spring, but these are the um, fall blooming calico asters. Very popular with the insects because they're still out there trying to find food in the, in October and November. So be sure you have some asters in your garden. I don't even know how many kinds of asters grow in Georgia, but 
Uh, I think I have six or seven different kinds uh, scattered throughout the yard. So these are good ones to have. And I believe this may be New York ironweed because that's a picture I had to take with my camera pointing almost straight up in the air because it is um, about eight or 10 feet tall. So obviously you got to have a, a space where you can put this at the back of the border, but it is a very popular with the uh, butterflies late in the, in the fall in October when, the, when it's cooling off because it has so many small blooms in such a small area. They can bloom as early as August, can continue blooming on into late October, okay? This lion's foot is another plant I found in the, on the side of the road and I got me some seeds from it and grew this. I had never seen it before. And somebody said, you don't wanna plant that, that's, an, that's aggressive. And since I don't care if my whole yard is covered with flowers, I don't mind it being aggressive. It gets pretty tall, so if, you want, if, you're, if you're trying to have a more formal garden, you'll wanna put it to the middle or back of the garden. This is growing in semi-shade, get some late afternoon sun, okay? And in November, Witch hazel, it's, it's, it's one of the few things, uh, one of the few trees I know of, there may not be any of it, but this is the only one I'm familiar with that actually blooms this late in the year. Uh, has those pretty little yellow blooms all along the, the tree limbs. Um, and I don't have any idea what pollinators use this plant other than for nectar, but it is a great little tree. It is not a huge tree. Uh, mine somehow or another something broke the top out of it so it's more sprawling and has uh multiple stalk multiple stems but uh i've seen a witch hazel in the woods that was probably 40 feet tall and had a single trunk so they can be trained to be a single trunk or they can be pruned to to be a more shrubby looking tree about six feet tall i guess is what mine is a lot of people don't like asiatum called miss flower because it can reseed profusely, but anything that reseeds, if you keep an eye on your garden, you pull those little plants out early in the season and then and they're not a problem to pull up. I love them because once again, they have lots of flowers in a small space for the pollinators. They add some color to the garden when a lot of other things are beginning to die back and they fill in space. I like, I like all my space filled in. <laughs> And that's the last slide on there because I don't have anything in my garden except non-natives that bloom in, in December. So I guess if anybody has a question, you can ask it. I won't guarantee that I can answer it, but I will try. So and right now, there's no questions in the chat box, but you are okay. welcome to enter a question in the chat box. Carol, that was super interesting. I learned several things that I think will be useful to me in uh, propagation of yeah. some native plants. I have propagate, I, I'm planting up between 100 and 200 plants uh, every other day from things that I grew. I got kind of went overboard <laughs> with my seeding in the spring. So I'm having to pot them up into bigger pots now. So I'm busy every, for a portion of almost every day potting plants. I've probably got 3000 pots in my backyard growing things out for our plant sale. So be sure you mark your calendar September 19th from nine to 12 for our plant sale. If you're interested in learning more about native plants, we have a Facebook page, just type, it, type in West Georgia chapter. The GNPS has a, 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 face, has a Facebook page and, uh, well, excuse me, they have a website at gnps.org. We meet in Carrollton on, on the even numbered months, the third, it's been so long since we met, I can't remember if we meet on Tuesday or Thursday, I think it's on Thursday, but I'll, I'll get you that information. And everybody's welcome to come. Uh, you can join or you can just come as a guest. We don't charge any fees uh, except the, for your membership fee if you decide to join. So we would welcome all of you to become part of our group. Uh, we have a great bunch of people. <laughs> Ooh, we're getting some questions now. Okay. okay. So somebody asks, Deb asks, is your yard mostly in sun? My yard is mostly in shade. I have uh, as you come up to the house along the driveway, it opens up at the end of the driveway and I have a vegetable garden there with a fence around it. And then beside that, 
on my na- on the side next to my neighbor who has no trees in his yard, I have a, a nice big uh, sunny garden. But m- the majority of my garden, the majority of my yard is under oaks and hickory trees. So it's pretty well shaded. And also another person says, does Indian pink need full sun? I have some planted in almost all shade. I have some planted that gets morning sun. I have some that's planted that gets afternoon sun. The only one I've ever planted in full sun made it for two years and it had ne- it never came back. The best blooming one is the one that gets about two and a half hours of morning sun. Uh, the others do bloom, but they don't bloom. And, and they're not as old as the one in the two and a half hours of sun. So that may have something to do with it. But I find that the one that blooms in the shade does not bloom as profusely and it doesn't make seeds because I don't think the pollinators get into that shaded area as much as they stay in the sun. Another question is, does Georgia aster need lots of sun? I have one in partial shade and it no longer blooms. Should I move it or get another plant and put it in full sun? It is a full sun plant and when you have a full sun plant planted in in some shade, the blooms are what suffer. You'll you'll see a decline in the blooming the more shade it gets. I would dig it up in the fall. I usually, if I do any transplanting or planting of new trees and and perennials, I do it around Thanksgiving because it's still not, the ground's not frozen, it's not too terribly cold, and it's not so hot and dry. And then it has the whole fall, the rest of the fall and all winter to grow a good root system for the spring and summer when it's going to be hot. So if I were you, I would wait on moving that until the fall, maybe November, and then move it to a place where it'll stay in full sun. And also they get very tall and leggy. If you prune those when they're just maybe six, eight, 10 inches tall, they will branch out and they will give you more blooms. Uh, I forgot to prune mine this year and they're beginning to fall over because they've gotten so tall. So I won't get as many blooms, but I'm gonna have to move mine too because they've gotten in the shade recently. So I'm gonna have to move those out into the sun garden again. That is the, um, the story of a gardener's life is that, you know, it starts one way and everything goes well and then all the trees get bigger and start shading it out, right? <laughs> yeah, I had a huge, I probably uh, two or 300 uh, non-native hellebores under the big oak tree next to my mailbox. And it, after some of those heavy rains and winds, it started leaning towards the power lines. So the power company came and took it down. So I now have a full sun garden where I used to have full shade. And uh, it's a great place that I'm putting in a big milkweed garden for the butterflies, though, for the monarchs. Well, that is the last of the questions that we've gotten in the text box. Carol, I just want to thank you so much for um, coming and chatting with us and putting this together in webinar format. I know that um, this is the first webinar that you've officially done, I think. So yes. I know it was a, a leap of faith to make sure that we... Um, that we worked it out, but I'm really grateful that you did. We had a good turnout today and we thank everybody for coming. Oh, I'm getting some more stuff in the chat box. Let me see if it's questions. Oh, they're saying thank you. And um, for everybody who's here, I will follow up with an email that links to the recording of the presentation. I'll, um, I'll record, it'll, the recording will go up on our YouTube page. It'll take a little while to process that. So this afternoon, I'll send out an email with that um, and I'll send you information about the upcoming plant sale um, for the Native Plant Society on September 19th in Carrollton, um, and a quick link to a survey as well. And I'd be really grateful if you all would follow up on the survey and give us a little feedback on um, what you learn, what you might be interested in learning in the future. So thanks again, Carol. Oh, I will send you links for the websites, for the perfect, NPS and for the Facebook, and for uh, a couple other things that. I use when I'm doing a lot of research. That's a great way for people to start learning about native plants. Perfect. I will share that in my follow-up email. I hope everybody has a great remainder of your morning. If you are a master gardener, Paulding master gardener logged on, um, you can log out, take a quick bathroom break. We'll log back in on our other link, our meeting room link for the master gardener meeting um, at around 11 o'clock and get started on that. I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you again, Carol. You're welcome. Talk to you soon. All right. Okay.